Aloha, everyone. I'm Ani Menon, Director of Government and Community Affairs at Hawaiian Telecom. I wanted to welcome you to a very special Hawaiian Telecom University. We're very proud to present Telehealth 101 in partnership with the Queen's Health System, Hawaii Pacific Health, and HMSA. Just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Please be sure to take our poll. It's on the right side of the screen. We'll be sharing results from it later in the meeting. Also, please submit questions anytime during the presentation in the Q&A panel, also on the right side of your screen. We'll try our best to answer all your questions at the end of the presentations. And if you're not speaking, please go on mute. I'd like to introduce Su Shen. Uh, can everybody please go on mute if you're not speaking? Oh, I'd like to introduce Su Shen. Um, she's our president and general manager of Hawaiian Telecom. Before being our president and GM, Su is our chief of staff, providing strategic counsel and working behind the scenes to keep our leadership team aligned. Su, before I hand it off to you, I think there's somebody still on the phone who's not quite on mute. Um, funny little hiccups happen during telehealth visits like this as well. Can everybody on the phone please make sure that if you're not speaking, that you're on mute. Still hear a little bit of background. Let's go on mute if you're not speaking. Okay, Sue. Thanks, Ani, and aloha everyone. Thank you for joining our third virtual Hawaiian Telecom University or HTU event of the year and our first HTU geared for a general audience. Some of you may know that Hawaiian Telecom has hosted HTU for many years. Technology changes so rapidly and hosting an educational event was really a great way for us to reach out and help local business professionals better understand current technology and how it can help drive their goals. But technology isn't just for businesses. More and more, we're all using different types of technology in our homes every day smartphones and smart appliances to virtual assistants like Alexa and attending virtual meetings and events like this one over WebEx. And of course, our adoption of technology has by the COVID-19 pandemic. Under normal circumstances, you might not think twice about going to see your doctor for a routine checkup or if you have that cold you just can't seem to shake. But the pandemic has really changed that. With COVID cases on the rise again, people are less inclined to physically go and see a medical professional. And this is where technology can help to fill that gap. Much like virtual meetings, quickly becoming the new normal at work for so many of us, interest in telehealth is growing. Telehealth uses telecommunications technologies to deliver health-related services and information that support patient care, administrative activities, and health education. As a communication provider, Hawaiian Telecom is focused on connections from physical ones to emotional ones. We provide the technology that enables our customers to connect with what matters most. Today, we are pleased to connect you with some of our partners in our community. Local experts will share the benefits of telehealth, how it works, and what you can expect. Before I turn this over to Ani Menon, who will introduce our speakers and moderate this session, I'd like to share how our company has responded to our customers' needs during this pandemic. Not just because I'm incredibly proud of our team and look for every opportunity to brag about them, but because of the tremendous sense of responsibility that I know our team feels to keep our community connected, especially as so many of us were forced to quickly work and learn from home. As an essential business, Hawaiian Telecom has continued to operate and serve our customers throughout this challenging time. Some things have changed, of course. For example, more than half of our workforce, including many of our call center representatives, have been working from home for more than four months now. Our technical staff, whose duties require them to be at an outside location, have continued to work following procedures to protect their health and safety, as well as the health and safety of our customers. What hasn't changed is our ability to serve our customers. We've successfully adapted to a new way of working and continue to serve our community without skipping a beat. Our team's flexibility and dedication enabled us to help many critical organizations manage through this pandemic, whether they needed increased bandwidth, online meeting solutions, or additional phone lines. Often we were called upon to help stand a solution up very quickly. 
For example, over one weekend, we set up and trained state employees to staff a temporary call center to handle a flood of unemployment calls. And not surprisingly, we've seen internet traffic increase about 50% during peak daytime hours. But we accelerated network upgrades to ensure that we have enough capacity in our core network so our customers would experience seamless connection. And, by, and our teams continue to monitor our network closely 24 by seven. I could go on and on about the extraordinary efforts of our team to keep our customers connected, but I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention their incredible hearts. Not only did our employees volunteer to sew face masks for our frontline teams, but they stepped up to donate more than $22,000 to the Department of Education. And this funding helped to ensure that the most vulnerable children in our community who rely on school for meals and not go hungry. It's selfless acts of kindness like these that have had me convinced that as a team and a community, we all come out of this challenging time stronger, more resilient, and empathetic. I'm incredibly proud of our team and all they have overcome to continue to serve our community. In closing, I'd like to thank our panel extremely busy schedules to be with us today. Finally, please remember that Hawaiian Telecom is here to support you. If you're in need of assistance, please reach out through our call center, website, or social media. We're committed to Hawaii and we're here for you. Thank you again for joining us and have a great session. Thank you, Sue. We indeed have three fantastic panelists today to help us learn more about telehealth. Together, they represent both the payer and provider worlds. We'll hear from Dr. Koenig from Queens, Dr. Lin from Hawaii Pacific Health, and Wendy from HMSA. They will each have some time to present a perspective on telehealth before we open up for Q&A and ask all of our burning questions for our panelists. As a reminder, folks, please submit questions anytime in the Q&A panel located on the right side of your screen and mute if you're not speaking. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Matthew Koenig. Dr. Koenig is a medical director of telemedicine for the Queen's Health Systems. He received his medical degree from the University of Maryland and completed his residency and fellowship at John Hopkins Hospital. His professional credentials include certification in neurology from the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. Dr. Koenig, we're very excited to hear from you. Thanks so much for having me here today. Um, so uh, as was mentioned, I'm Matt Koenig. I'm a neurologist and I'm the medical director of telehealth for Queens Health Systems. And I'm really happy to be able to have the opportunity to meet with you today to talk about telehealth um, and a little bit about how to prepare for a telehealth session and, and how telehealth can be important in your healthcare. So we can uh, go move on to the next slide, please. First of all, what, what is telehealth? Um, telehealth can mean uh, different things to different people. And we have um, examples of telehealth that are in the hospital, uh, that are in clinics, um, and probably most importantly for this audience, telehealth for patients in, the, in their homes um, using home computers, laptops, tablet computers, and smartphones. Um, but telehealth as a concept really means that healthcare is, is provided by a patient and provider who are separated by distance. Um, and, and the importance of telehealth is that uh, it can be more timely than in-person healthcare, um, more, more uh, on demand and more timely and more convenient for patients to be seen uh, virtually when they don't have time to leave work or leave school um, or can be seen in their own home. And, and that can be especially important for patients with mobility problems. Um, so telehealth has become very, very important in the, the time of COVID uh, when, when uh, people are trying to stay away from um, uh, crowded locations like doc potentially doctors waiting rooms. Uh, but it really has a, an important role before COVID and after COVID in providing timely and convenient health care. Uh, so we can move on to the next slide, please. Queens, like uh, really every a healthcare facility in the state has seen a very rapid expansion of telehealth during, during the COVID pandemic. And we have been doing a fair amount of telehealth prior to that, about 200 visits um, uh, per month were being done virtually. Uh, but we saw a 50-fold increase uh, in this spring uh, during the COVID pandemic. And uh, the numbers have really held steady throughout the summer. We're doing about 2,500 telehealth visits um, per week at this point. 
Um, and what that means for you um, at, as, as potential patients or consumers of healthcare is that your doctor is doing telehealth. There are very few healthcare professionals at Queens um, who are not doing telehealth at this point. And many providers had some experience with telehealth prior to this spring, but pretty much every provider that I interact with has, has substantial experience with telehealth and is using that regularly at this point. And so it really is an option now for you to see your doctor um, by telehealth. Uh, so we can move on to the next slide, please. Queens um, has it at the queens.org website. Um, you can go and uh, find a doctor. We have actually have a find a doctor feature at queens.org. And we actually have uh, fields that you can uh, check as shown on, on here to figure out if the doctor is accepting new patients and also if that doctor is, is using telehealth. Um, and so you can actually uh, use that search feature to find, find a doctor, see if they're accepting new patients and see if they're seeing patients virtually. And that's a very convenient tool uh, for identifying doctors at Queens who are telehealth capable and you can see virtually. Um, I think probably the most important message, though, is that when a lot of people think of telehealth, they think about a, a urgent care kind of visit that's not scheduled. And, you know, for example, people have an earache and they say, should I go to an urgent care or should I go to Minute Clinic where I could see a doctor virtually? And it's not my regular doctor, but it's a doctor that I'm only going to see one time. Um, and that is a model of telehealth that can be very successful. Uh, but the majority of telehealth that we're actually doing at Queens is follow up of established patients. Um, so your you know, regular doctor that you see for primary care or your cardiologist or your neurologist um, at Queens it is currently seeing patients by telehealth. So you don't have to go on the internet looking for a new doctor to treat your problem. Um, for most conditions, uh, we do have doctors available um, I mean, your, your regular doctor can be available to see you virtually for those conditions, and, and especially for follow-up care. That can be uh, a very convenient and timely choice. Okay, next slide. We, there are a lot of different, you know, those of you have, who have done telehealth, and I'm sure some of the, the people on, on this uh, webinar today have done telehealth already. Um, and so, there are a number of different technologies or applications or apps that can be used for telehealth video visits. And uh, certainly among the healthcare uh, organizations in, in Hawaii at this point, there are different platforms or technologies that are being used. Things like WebEx, which is what we're on today, or Zoom, uh, or uh, other, other um, technologies are commonly being used for, for video visits. And so in, in preparing for your video visit, it is, it is important to talk to, to the clinic, uh, the clinic that you're going to be seeing the doctor at, and figure out what is the, whether there's a download, an app that needs to be downloaded ahead of the visit, and get that ready, or how the doctor is going to communicate with you uh, on the day of visit so you can connect to video. And that may be by email, where they send a link to you over email, and you click the link to connect. It may be a text message that comes to you that has a link to, to connect, or maybe through what are called patient portals. And so an example of the patient portal uh, we use is called MyChart um, through our electronic medical record. And that's a portal that you can go on through a smartphone or computer, uh, log into the portal itself, and then launch the video visit out of that portal. So before the day of the visit, it's important to talk to the clinic and, and hear from them how that link is going to come through, whether it's through a patient portal, text message, or email message. Okay, next slide. I think the other thing that I'll mention about platforms is that because there are a number, a number of different technologies that are being used, just because you use Zoom to see one doctor doesn't mean the next doctor that you're going to see is going to be on the same platform. So it's really important to clarify that ahead of the visit of what technology is being used. I have talked to patients who tell me they have four different apps on their phone now because there's four different applications that are being used to see their different doctors. So that does happen. Um, what are, uh, here's some other important tips of preparing for your telehealth visit to make sure at the time of the visit that everything goes well um, and that 
you're able to communicate with your physician, see and hear your, your doctor or nurse practitioner, um, and, and able to have a successful visit. So the first step really, you know, first step, as I mentioned, is talking to the clinic ahead of time and making sure that you have all the information that you need ahead of the visit, just like you would with an in-person visit. The second step is making sure that you have appropriate technology in the home uh, or school or work or wherever it is that you're doing your visit. And that could be a laptop computer that has a built-in camera or a desktop computer with an external webcam and, and microphone and, and speakers. Uh, or it can be a smartphone. But you'll need one of those technologies to connect to your video visit. Uh, I always recommend headphones and, and wired headphones are easier. Uh, they're more successful uh, than Bluetooth uh, headsets. Um, so a wired headset is really important to keep your conversation private with your doctor and make sure you and the doctor can hear each other. Um, the next is the environment in which you're doing the visit is very, very important. You wanna be in a private location um, that's quiet so there's not noise bleed and the doctor can hear you. Um, and, and it needs to be brightly lit so the doctor can see you clearly. Um, you don't wanna be backlit. So if there's natural light coming in through a window, um, you want that window to be in front of you rather than behind you. If there's a lot of light coming in behind you, the doctor is not gonna be able to see you. So you know, if you're in a room that doesn't have overhead lighting, putting a lamp or a spotlight on your face will be important so the doctor can see you clearly. Um, and finally, uh, having a good bandwidth and uh, internet connection uh, in the location that you're gonna be during your video visit. And so uh, many technologies and platforms actually have a self-test function to do before the video visit that allows you to test your camera, test your microphone, make sure that you can hear, um, and also make sure that you have adequate bandwidth um, or internet connection necessary to do the video visit. Um, and then finally, uh, a, a visit that's done in the home on a smartphone or a laptop uh, is not exactly the same as an in-person visit. And there are limitations to the amount of physical examination that can be done without touching a person. And so if there are, uh, if there are medical equipment within the home that can be used during the video visit, that can really augment and give us some information about physical examination or vital signs. And so examples would be a uh, blood pressure cuff in the home, a glucose monitor, or a scale, that can at least help augment your visit and provide some physical examination and vital signs to the doctor uh, to provide you better care overall. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop there and we're gonna have a panel at the end and I'll be happy to answer questions during the Q&A. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Koenig. You answered a lot of the questions that I've had on my mind just off the bat. I think we all have many more apps on our phone than ever before. I know that I do for sure. And um, our understanding the importance of virtual connections and options. I think I'm gonna call my PCP after this to see if uh, they offer telehealth opportunities for us. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. James Lin. Dr. Lin is Vice President of Information Technology at Hawaii Pacific Health and a pediatric hospitalist at Kapiolani Medical Center for Women and Children. Hawaii Pacific Health is a three-time winner of the HIMSS Davies Award and Stage 7 HIMSS Hospital and Clinics in using electronic health record adoption and improvement in patient care. Dr. Lin is board certified in clinical informatics and general pediatrics. Dr. Lin, we are eager to hear from you today. Oh, thank you, Annie, and uh, thank you everyone for uh, inviting me to participate and uh, I'm really excited to see how many people have joined our, our, our session today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Koenig. That was a great introduction um, to telehealth. And um, as what I wanted to cover during my time here is to review some of the other, uh, uh, other methods telehealth can uh, be presented to you as uh, a patient in care of uh, outside Hawaii Pacific Health or at Queens. Um, uh, as uh, similar to our colleagues at Queens, uh, everybody at Hawaii Pacific Health is uh, is been using video visits uh, as well as scheduled telephone visits, and increasing the use of the patient portal and uh, uh, that we use uh, called MyChart as well. Um, 
I think uh, one of the one of the glaring uh, 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 spotlights that COVID-19 has put on us is we need to be able to be strategic and we need to be able to meet uh, the, the needs of the people that we're caring for, but also think of ways that people can also help take care of themselves. And so while a video visit, a telephone visit, uh, interaction through a patient portal is, uh, is, uh, is uh, are ways to do that, while nothing replaces the face-to-face -face visit uh, to meet your doctor, have the doctor examine you, there are a lot of appropriate visits that can be handled through telehealth to make those face-to-face -face visits more meaningful uh, and more, uh, more appropriate where some other type of interaction like telehealth could be, uh, could be the best way to handle a, a question that you may have rather than, again, take a half day off of work to be able to get to the uh, office Perhaps there's a waiting time uh, for uh, for delays, and the session is uh, sort of wrapped up within five minutes. And uh, you know, you go like, "Well, boy, uh, uh, that that was a lot of a lot of things I could have gotten uh, uh, gotten done or gotten my answers done in a different way." And that's how telehealth comes into play. Uh, well, in whether it's a video visit where you can actually uh, see your care team or provider or uh, anyone within our HPA system. A scheduled telephone visit, picking up the phone, don't have to deal with uh, necessarily video technology or bandwidth. That's a perfectly appropriate way to get some of your answers, uh, get answers to some of your questions, as well as connect with your provider. Um, but I think one thing that uh, when we talk about all the different apps on uh, uh, patient's device or connectivity, uh, the, the portal, uh, whether it's my chart or whatever port type of patient portal your healthcare provider has to connect with their electronic health record, I, I think is square one and invaluable. Because not only does it uh, allow you uh, some conveniences uh, uh, such as scheduling, uh, requesting a medication refill, being able to see some of the information that's in your chart uh, whether it's lab tests or, or trending for your own health education. Um, but there's a lot of interactions that can happen. So if you wake up at one in the clock in the morning and you've got a sore throat and you're not quite sure, well, do I need to take time off work? Do I need to come into the office? Do I need tests? Do I need medicine? What do I need? There's a lot of methods through the portal that you can send a message uh, with a picture uh, as an option to your care team or structured questionnaires that we're calling e-visits, uh, which can help uh, provide the questions and answers in a structured email that your care team can then review as well as review your chart at the same time and then be able to respond to you through your patient portal. So you don't necessarily need even a telephone or a video or an office visit. Some of that advice you can get uh, directly uh, at any time of day, 24/7, um, with some uh, with uh, with your answer coming later in the day or the or the following day if it's a non-urgent condition, uh, and COVID-19 has uh, enabled us to uh, or forced us to also include screening for uh, coronavirus in there. So if you have a cough, if you have a fever, if you have an exposure, you can send a structured question to your healthcare provider and be able to get an answer. Next slide, please. And the near future is coming um, in that some of the devices that uh, you may be using at home to stay on top of your diabetes or your hypertension or other conditions um, are coming to become part of your medical record to provide that uh, more often and more real-time data to your healthcare team. So rather than, let's say, if you have diabetes and you're writing your glucose that you're seeing in a paper form and then either uh, bringing them to the office to review with your uh, care team or your uh, health care physician, um, but you're only being able to get in once a month or twice a month. Well, in the near future, I, I, what I foresee is that some of that is going to be integrated with that patient portal app. You'll have 
essentially a glucometer that integrates and sends that information without you having to write it down into your patient portal. And then over time, the uh, electronic health record can potentially summarize that report for the healthcare provider on a more often basis so that care team can then send you a message or have that video conference or have that telephone call saying, hey, maybe you should increase your insulin uh, during the morning to get your sugars under better control. Uh, so it becomes more of a team aspect with, uh, with a convenience aspect through your patient portal. And that doesn't necessarily also, uh, and uh, what I also see in the near future happening is access on the inpatient side as well as outpatient side. So tele-ICU is a concept that's taking hold um, in many areas across the nation. Um, and as we all know in Hawaii, sometimes we have trouble finding uh, adequate physicians uh, in supply to, to come and staff uh, some of our um, needed specialties. Well, for instance, ICU <clears throat> is an example where uh, a, a, a ICU specialist or their care team can be monitoring hospitals in Big Island or hospitals in Kauai or patients in Maui, as well as other hospitals in Oahu, being able to be those eyes and ears for the local teams that will still be in those ICUs, but be able to provide advice uh, through uh, video uh, to that local team on what to do for those acute uh, patients, those critical patients, uh, and then be able to spread out our, 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 our knowledge for, for those key physicians or those key specialties across different hospitals without even being physically present. Um, telestroke is another example of how neurologists like Dr. Koenig and others at Hawaii Pacific Health are being able to provide uh, consultations on whether medication is needed for a stroke or not, but uh, without having to physically be there in the middle of the night when that decision needs to be made here and there. Also consultations, uh, oncology consultations, second opinions, other things. If, if the future turns out the, light, the way um, we'd like it to, then perhaps some of those video consultations that can be had for you or I here in Hawaii to that subspecialist uh, in Seattle for our oncology program or uh, uh, UCSD for our, 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 our child subspecialties, uh, those are going to be happening and are starting to happen now to be able to get more medical advice, more information, so you and your care team can uh, help take care of yourselves and keep your keep your uh, make a make a healthier Hawaii. Next slide, please. So we all know telehealth is convenient. It's effective. It's secure, it's private, especially through your patient portal app, uh, through my chart, uh, uh, through a web or through your smartphone. So uh, if you haven't already, I highly suggest take the lead today, contact your care team, ask how telehealth can work for you, download your uh, patient portal app uh, to be able to see what uh, information uh, to, is in your chart today. Uh, to make yourself uh, aware of what's uh, what's going on for your own health, as well as helping your care team uh, provide the best health for you, health and care advice for you as well. Thank you. Mahalo, Dr. Lin. It's apparent that we're no longer talking about telehealth being the future, but are living the future uh, and can only expect to see more technology enabling telemedicine as uh, we move forward. The only constant is change I've learned and the adoption of telehealth as an available option is an easy one to get on board with. Thanks so much for sharing with us today. We've heard from Dr. Lin and Dr. Koenig, both physicians providing care using telehealth. I don't know about you in the audience, uh, but I'm interested to learn about telehealth from an insurance provider's perspective. Lucky we have Wendy Nakasone with us today. Wendy is the Vice President of Consumer Health Solutions at Hawaii Medical Service Association, what we all call HMSA. As VP of Consumer Health Solutions, Wendy is responsible for technology solutions on the consumer and health platforms at HMSA, including telehealth. She has been at HMSA for 17 years and has led a variety of areas, including the Medicare line of business, brand, marketing, communications, and consumer experience. She's a graduate of Stanford University and has an MBA from Santa Clara. Wendy, thanks so much for being with us today. Let's learn some more. 
All right, aloha everyone. And thank you so much uh, to the Hawaiian Telecom team for inviting us here to talk about this really important topic. Uh, first of all, before we even begin, I, I really wanna thank uh, my fellow panelists as well as all of the providers in Hawaii. Um, I think as they have mentioned to you over the last four months, so many of our providers have put in the extra effort to embrace telehealth technology. Many of them and their um, staffs, you know, had to learn a lot about the different platforms. And it's because of that, we it's available for all of us. I know most people that I've talked to have had at least one or more visits over the last four months, uh, and some people for the very first time. And while I think, um, you know, it can be intimidating at first, I think once people try it, they actually find that they really like it. So I wanna kind of take a different perspective here. I think we've learned about what telehealth is, um, how to prepare for a visit, kind of what the future of telehealth is, but I wanna look at it from the patient perspective for people like you and me. So what really are the benefits of telehealth? I think if you think back all the way to January or February of 2020, most of us have had probably never even heard of the term social distancing or it never came out of our mouths. And now I think, you know, it is absolutely uh, a way of life for all of us. In fact, I'm sure even, you know, elementary school students all know what social distancing is. So, um, you know, and because of that, I think people uh, and rightly so have been uh, feeling apprehensive about leaving their homes and you know, going to see a doctor, you know, I think they worry about, you know, not um, being exposed to something if they go to a clinic or hospital setting. And so, you know, while I absolutely agree with all of that, I, I think it's also important for us to be sure that we're not delaying care or canceling doctor's appointments just because we don't feel that it's safe. I think this is where telehealth can be a really great option. Um, and and uh, I encourage all of you to give it a try. Um, at first, you know, I think uh, using new technology can be a little scary. And um, but I think our doctors and their teams have done a really great job of trying to help walk people through the different options. You know, kind of um, explaining to them what to expect. That you're going to receive a text or you're going to receive an email. All you need to do is click on that. And I think. Once you try it, you'll probably be pleasantly surprised at actually how easy it is. Um, in terms of um, having access to care from the comfort of your home, I, I think that actually is helpful for all of us. We are much more comfortable there. And I think as Dr. Lin had mentioned, you know, you also may have access to specialists who don't practice in your area. So say for, you're from a neighbor island, you might have access to a specialist here on Oahu and you don't even have to come travel here. So all of that is really um, a, a wonderful benefit of telehealth. And, and finally, I think one of the ones that most of us can all relate to is really the convenience factor. Uh, no need to fight traffic, get in your car, find the parking, uh, sit in a waiting room where you, know, you might be a little bit apprehensive about the other people in the waiting room. You know, it, it's really so convenient for us. Um, I think also we know a lot of people do have challenges in finding reliable transportation, finding a ride to the doctor, or maybe people are used to taking, you know, mass transit, but they don't want to do that right now. So telehealth can also help there. And, and finally, you know, if you're a caregiver, as we know, a lot of people in Hawaii are caregivers, it can be really difficult to find time to, to go to your doctor's appointment. Because in order to do that, you would have to find someone to fill in for you to, um, you know, so you can take the time off to go see the doctor. So a telehealth visit could also be something that really works for you. Um, and I would highly recommend that you check with your doctor to see what options are available to you. Uh, I think that, you know, as the two doctors have explained to us, Telehealth visits are really just another way of receiving care, but at a distance. And I think there's so many doctors that have embraced this over the last four or five months. And you'll probably be really surprised when you contact your doctor that there are different options that are available to you. 
So can we go to the next slide? Okay, and as uh, the representative from the insurance side of the house, this is a question that we get asked often, right? Which is, are telehealth visits covered? And while I can't speak for all health plans, what I, what I can tell you is that most health plans in Hawaii do provide coverage for telehealth visits. Um, I would highly encourage you to call your health plan to check and see what um, options are available for you. Uh, there are maybe specific benefits of your plan, but most health plans do cover it. And usually a telehealth visit does not cost any more than an in-person visit. It, it's really, as we talked about, uh, receiving care just in a different way. And so um, during the public health emergency, many health plans have, you know, waived copays because I think we're all concerned that people are um, not getting care that they need. And so we, we wanted to make it absolutely um, something that's important for the, um, our members to be able to receive. And, and again, you know, there may be specific um, benefits that apply to Medicare and Medicaid plans, but even those plans, uh, even the federal and state governments have made some rule changes during this pandemic period in order to allow for more people to receive visits via telehealth. And so, once again, I would encourage you to um, check with your health plan to see what the benefits, the specific benefits of your plan are. And finally, I just want to say that, you know, I think for us, the most important thing is that we don't want to see people delaying or foregoing care because they're uncomfortable with going to see their doctor. And because of that, so many of our providers in the community have uh, found ways to still visit and check in with patients. Um, and especially those who have um, established patient, patients, it's a great way to do a follow up visit. So I would highly encourage all of you um, to give it a give it a try. I, I think you know most people have found that it's um, really actually pretty uh, easy, and it you know they're they're not it's not as scary as you think. And in fact, we have you know our data shows that most of our members that have tried telehealth are now doing repeat visits. So they're going for their second and third and fourth telehealth visits because the first one turned out so well. And th thanks so much for having me here today. Thank you so much, Wendy. There are so many benefits of telehealth, and it's incredible that telehealth visits are covered and that many plans have waived copays. I know that's huge. It eases a lot of people's minds about using telehealth as an option. Thanks so much for being here today and sharing that with us. Well, we've seen a lot of questions roll in for our panelists and are excited to jump in and get them answered. Um, can panelists, can you please come back on and join us and let's let's answer some of these questions that have come in from the audience. We're, uh, we had a poll that we initially posted. We had some technical difficulties with the poll. So we're just going to skip over that and go straight into the many questions we have from the audience. Let me see here. The first one uh, is about examples of visits. Uh, for telehealth. So, Dr. Koenig, if you don't mind me picking on you for a moment, can you help us understand what are some types of visits that uh, people can do virtually via telemedicine or telehealth? And what are some others that would require someone's physical presence at a doctor's office? Great. Thanks for asking that question. Um, and I think the first important point to emphasize is that not everything can be done safely by telehealth. Um, and, you know, as I'm a neurologist, so as a neurologist, the physical examination is a, is a big part of what we do, um, especially to make a new diagnosis or determine, you know, what problem a patient has, the physical examination is a large component of how we practice medicine. Um, and so what I would say is that for an initial visit with a specialist, that is often done in person and should be done in person because the physical examination um, is needed in that in that case, and including the ability to touch the patient, listen to the heart sounds and lung sounds, um, feel you know check reflexes, feel tone, um, 
There's a surprising amount of the neurological examination that can be done by video. I, I'm, as Dr. Lin mentioned, I, I practice a lot of telestroke. Um, and so we're actually able to do quite a bit of the stroke examination with just video. Um, but there are some parts of the peripheral nerve exam as a neurologist that I would need to do in the office. So an initial visit with a, a doctor that you've never seen before, who's a specialist, that's often done better in person. And then follow-up care can often be provided virtually, um, especially in chronic disease states. So, for example, diabetes care. Um, if you see your endocrinologist for diabetes, the initial visit and probably an annual visit should be done in person because there's a big physical examination component. But a lot of the chronic medical management can just be done virtually. I, you know, I think there, you know, there are emergency situations also that you don't want to try and do virtually that there's still a need for urgent care centers in the emergency department. So if you're having chest pain, that's not something that should be uh, treated virtually. That's a medical emergency. Potentially, if you're having stroke symptoms like weakness on one side of the body, that's something you need to seek emergency in person care for and shouldn't be um, done at home on a on a on a smartphone. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the next question. So we've seen some virtual platforms recently criticized for data, data breaches, security, privacy issues. How do providers address this uh, during their telehealth appointments with patients? And this question, uh, let's ask Dr. Lin. Sure, uh, that's a great question because security and privacy uh, of something as sensitive as uh, uh, your own health questions and health issues is one of the utmost um, uh, principles that all healthcare systems, including Hawaii Pacific Health, hold dear. So, uh, as mentioned, there's a lot of different platforms out there, and some have um, what's uh, what's called HIPAA or patient care. Uh, level encryption uh, that's uh, included as part of the platform, um, and some do not. Um, so uh, we've we've you know we've probably heard um, uh, or some may have heard about uh, you know Zoom conference calls perhaps being you know uh, uh, people jumping in inappropriately, uh, and um, and so there there are some cases where yes uh, the the question about security and privacy that has come up so most uh, if not all healthcare providers have selected uh, video platforms that are secure that are encrypted that are password protected or uh, hipaa level uh, protected that uh, they should feel uh, very comfortable that their conversation is is, is secure and private um, well, there are there have been waivers uh, put out by the government in times of this public health emergency. So some of the platforms uh, that uh, are not commonly used uh, for um, healthcare discussions, like a FaceTime or a Skype or others, uh, those are okay to use um, during this time. Um, and, but uh, uh, most healthcare providers are moving towards platforms or have already put in platforms that are encrypted and uh, are safe and secure. Thank you, Dr. Lin. I think the message is to reach out to your provider for all those in the audience, and they'll be able to help you understand which virtual platforms they use and the requirements that they have for the telehealth visits. And from what we heard today from Dr. Koenig, Dr. Lin, and Wendy is that many physicians, many providers already do telehealth. Uh, it's just a matter of us reaching out to them uh, to see if that's something that's an option that's available to us and what types of options are available. Thank you, Dr. Lin. So we have some doctors who are on the, uh, in the audience as well. And uh, we have a, a question specifically, I think, Wendy, for you. It's important to all of us. I know that our doctors get paid, especially, you know, things, you know, mass pandemics like COVID-19 have highlighted the importance of our healthcare workers. So thank you all so much for what you do. We want to make sure you get paid for you what you do. The question here from a physician is, is reimbursement the same for telemedicine consult versus an office visit for providers? Thanks for the question. Um, so I think during this pandemic time, so first and foremost, uh, I don't want you to take anything I say as gospel because there are specifics for different health insurance plans as well as different, like if you're, um, 
seeing patients who have a government sponsored plan like Medicare or Medicaid. But in Hawaii, we do have a, a payment parity law, which uh, requires us to pay the same amount for an office visit and for uh, audio video telehealth visit. So for the most part, um, there would be the same amount of payment. But what I would suggest is that you check with your uh, provider services representative at you know whatever health plan you know if you're HMSA or, or another health plan uh, to check and see what the uh, compensation is like. Thank you, Wendy. And is that payment parity law that you mentioned is that something that we can expect to go into the future, or is that does that have a, a dead stop? Is that sunset at some date? The payment parity law in Hawaii is law. It's been law I think since 2016. So that is not a temporary, but some of the rules around payments for Medicare and Medicaid are temporary during the public health emergency. Great, thank you. We have another question here about children. Uh, this is a great one. Are children treated differently for telehealth than adults? More specifically, do pediatric doctors do anything different? And I know, Dr. Lin, you are a pediatric hospitalist at Kapiolani, so this might be a good one for you to answer for us. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. One is uh, a couple things. One is uh, that uh, we have to take in, into account is, um, well, the age of the child, how appropriate they would be for uh, a telehealth visit and what the concern is, you know. Uh, as mentioned before, there are some things that we, we as pediatricians need to look at. Uh, you can't really look at an eardrum for an ear infection through uh, a, a smartphone, although some, I have seen some apps that have started to describe how they can do that, but uh, I don't quite trust them just yet. Um, but uh, for the most part, it, it, it would be similar to uh, a face-to-face -face visit between an adult uh, patient and an adult provider. Having the child there, uh, having uh, having the parent there to help um, uh, help the child uh, uh, perhaps to do some of the things that the the physician on the screen is asking the, uh, to to do, like hold up a you know a limb or uh, get a better look at a rash or uh, describe some of the symptoms, just like they would if they were in the office themselves. Um, so. Um, I think uh, some of the other uh, aspects of it is that if if the if the um, parent uh, also has access to that uh, their their child's chart through their patient portal, that is also possible that they have uh, uh, proxy access. So at certain ages, they'll be able to see their child's medicines, allergies, uh, request refills, and also connect for pediatric related concerns uh, through their portal as well to their pediatrician. Thanks, Dr. Lin, for answering that question for us. You know, I, I have a toddler at home, and I didn't realize until today that I was engaging in telehealth when I was texting his physician. And it's, it's a wonderful opportunity. You know, new parent, my husband and I are new parents, first child. And as you can imagine, we have so many questions that come up on a daily basis. You know, is this, is this little redness normal? Or is that really what that's supposed to look like? And, are they supposed to be talking at this point? So all of those questions I've been able to get answered via just text messages with my pediatrician, my son's pediatrician. Uh, it's a godsend to have, truly. So thank you all for what you do, uh, which leads to a question that I have, um, if, I, if I may ask a question myself. I'm often very conscious of not um, inconveniencing our doctors, the pediatrician that we text at like 3 a.m. in the morning, um, and our doctors who have given us their, you know, their, their phone numbers, a text on certain occasions. Is there a protocol you all follow? Is there a schedule in which you carve out, let's say, an hour or two a day specifically to answer those emails or those text messages that come through? Dr. Koenig, can you answer that one? And then maybe even Dr. Lin, if you want to, you know, answer after Dr. Koenig on what your, what your schedule is or the way you manage all of these various inquiries. It sounds like your doctor is very patient if he, <laughs> if he's letting you text him at three in the morning. That's a that's a very patient doctor. That's great. I'm glad to hear that actually. 
Um, I, the, the real answer is it, it differs in different practices, right? So there are, there are practices that um, are one physician in, in solo private practice. Um, and, and uh, you know, they may have office hours that are dedicated to answering messages that come through the patient portal or emails or text messages from patients. Um, and then there are bigger group practices that have a practice manager or a nurse or nurse practitioner in that practice who can field a lot of those initial calls and then escalate um, to the doctor if, if there's something that needs to be addressed more urgently. So there is some variation in, in, in how that works in different practices. Um, maybe maybe uh, Dr. Lin could answer more specifically to, to pediatrics, because I think a lot of, you know, pediatrics really has moved in that direction where there's a lot of more uh, timely communication between new parents, especially in the pediatrician. So I'll be interested to hear what Dr. Lin has to say. Yeah, mainly uh, a lot of my general pediatrics colleagues, um, they they do do that. Uh, they they have either a call service, uh, you know, it's like call anytime, and uh, the op uh, the call service will page me, and I'll be able to return the phone call or text. Um, and uh, again, I, I throw out the patient portal. There is that, you know, if it's two in the morning and you know you see. Uh, you know, your, your baby's doing fine and they're sleeping and there's a red mark there and that, you know, doesn't seem to be bothering him or, or, or that sort of stuff, you know, take a picture of it, send it through your patient portal uh, to your pediatrician uh, and they, uh, you know, a lot of the ones that I, uh, I work with, they sort of answer throughout the day, you know, um, perhaps they start um, early in the morning and take care of the, uh, uh, acute messages overnight and then throughout the day as they're seeing patients or in between phone calls or video visits, they'll they'll take one or two down uh, throughout the day and be able to get back to you within a day or two. Um, so I, I would say that if, if you do have a question, um, you know, uh, all pediatricians like myself would rather hear from, uh, hear from you rather than not hear from you um, if you have questions. Um, it's just a, again another way of connecting with uh, connecting with your care team, connecting with your doctor. Uh, this is what we signed up to do, and uh, and uh, and um, um, but uh, I I think I do on behalf of pediatricians. Uh, if it is two in the morning and you decide, well, this probably can wait six hours so we can call at eight. Uh, that's greatly appreciated as well. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Lin and Dr. Koenig. Sounds like we're not inconveniencing you all too much, but if we can wait, you know, to for the 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. call to, to be later on the day, we should probably do that. Um, thank you so much. Okay, let's get to the next question. What are the technical requirements for telehealth? Uh, I think Dr. Koenig did a great job uh, giving us an overview of what, you know, we need for telehealth. I'll just mention briefly, representing Hawaiian Telecom here, that it's really important that we have a secure internet connection for telehealth meetings and visits. We recommend 11 megabits download and 5 megabits upload. The upload speed is often just as important as download speed when it comes to these virtual connections and virtual meetings. So if you have any questions, Hawaiian Telecom is here to help. Please do reach out to us. We can help you with all the techn technology needs. But also good to note that you're going to need a computer or mobile device, something preferably with a microphone or a well, and a camera, depending on the type of telehealth connection you're looking to make. And then a video platform that your physician will work with you on and they'll give you uh, potentially an app to download onto your mobile device that you can connect. We have a few minutes left here to 11 o'clock and I'd really like to sum up today's panel by asking each of our panelists what the takeaway should be from each one of your, your uh, presentations for the audience today. So why don't I start with Wendy? Uh, if you want to share one takeaway that you really want our audience to remember, if that's the one thing you remember from this talk, what is it from your perspective? Um, I think I would say that telehealth visits are safe and can be a good um, alternative right now during this pandemic when we're all trying to stay safer at home. Thank you, Wendy. Dr. Lin, what is your one takeaway? Uh, I would say um, telehealth is 
is here. <laughs> Telehealth is now. Uh, think of the different ways that you can um, interact with your care team to be a healthier you uh, and sign up for your patient portal. Thank you, Dr. Lin. And Dr. Koenig? So what I've been telling patients is um, ask your doctor if telehealth is right for you. That's kind of that's kind of our buzz phrase, and maybe it's not that original, but ask your doctor if telehealth is right for you. And that that I think is the message. It's that your regular old doctor that you see all the time is doing telehealth right now. I think there are very few exceptions to that. So your your plain old doctor that you see all the time is doing telehealth, and so it's really worth a call to the office if you got a visit coming up and or you have a, a problem that needs to be addressed um, by your doctor to call ahead to the office, talk to the staff, talk to your physician, and see if that visit can be done virtually. Um, some things are not clinically appropriate to do virtually, that we need to do a hands-on physical examination. So it's important to have a little bit of discussion up front about whether the problem that you're having um, is appropriate to be addressed virtually. Um, or you need to, or you really need to come into the office to get safe care. Um, and you know, there are patients who who have preferences. Um, some patients prefer to be seen by video because it's more convenient. Other patients prefer to come into the office because that's how they're used to doing things. And so, having that discussion up front with the clinic staff of figuring out, um, do I have to go online and find a new doctor? Probably not. Right. Call call your regular clinic and see if your doctor is available to see you by telehealth um, and then make sure that the problem that you're having is appropriate to be addressed in that manner. Um, and then you can get that information about what video platform is being used um, and whether there's an app to download and how is that information going to be communicated to me? Is it going to be a text message? I click the link. Am I going to get an email? Click the link. Or is there a patient portal that I need to know about? So that kind of upfront conversation, we've been saying like call before you click, like this, don't just go online on day of visit and try click, try click something and hope that it works. Um, you know, do a little preparation uh, and talk to the clinic um, before the video visit's gonna happen and just make sure that you know how it's gonna happen, how you're gonna get that communication and make sure that that, that medium is the right uh, one for you, um, and that it's appropriate to be done by telehealth. So I think that's the that's the big message. Thank you, Dr. Koenig, and thank you, Dr. Lin and Wendy, for sharing your knowledge about telehealth and answering all of our questions. And thank you all in the audience for joining us today. We hope you found the presentations and discussion useful and informative. I know I feel more comfortable adding telehealth to the ways in which my family gets care and hope you all in the audience can say the same. Apologies if we couldn't get to all the questions. Uh, we strongly urge you to reach out to your healthcare provider and ask any of the questions you may have had uh, after today's conversation about telehealth and your telehealth options. I know as Dr. Koenig and Dr. Lin and Wendy mentioned, our providers and our payers are ready to help, so reach out to them. We'll be sending out a short survey to everyone, so please be on the lookout for that email and keep an eye out for more virtual Hawaiian Telecom University events like this one. Stay safe and healthy, everyone. Aloha and a hui ho.